Welcome MHM friends. This is just a friendly reminder that starting on February 1st of 2021, all MHM podcast network film reviews will be exclusively found on our channel on YouTube. If you are currently listening to our shows on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or any other streaming platform, please look the MHM podcast network up on YouTube today and click that subscribe button to keep up on our latest reviews. Once again, the MHM Podcast Network is moving exclusively to YouTube starting on February 1st, 2021. Thank you. Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. back to the golden age of the silver screen podcast here on the MHN podcast network. I'm Patrick. Hello, I'm Shane. And this month we're reviewing 1939's The Rules of the Game by Jean Renoir. Renoir? Help me, Shane. Yeah, Renoir. I'd, Renoir. I'd say Renoir. Renoir. I am not good with my French. I, I can do okay with Japanese, but not so good with the French. But all right. And I've seen a few of these guys' movies in the past, and when I was younger, I used to go, Gene Reno. <laughs> but that's definitely not how you say it. <laughs> and uh, this is the first of uh, two podcasts where uh, Shane are reviewing this film. This is the first part where we're actually reviewing the f- film itself uh, here on the Golden Age of the Silver Screen. Later this month, we're going to review the Criterion disc associated with this film uh, over on Criterion Critics. Uh, but before we get into our review of this film, uh, I have this summer Summary for it. In pre World War II France, dashing aviator Andre Girard, I'm going to go with that, completes his solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean and lands his one man plane at Le Bourget Airfield. He is greeted by his good friend Octave, who has the thankless job of informing the famous pilot that the aviators love, the very wealthy and very married Christine, the Marquis de la Chesnay is not present to greet Andre. The pilot is devastated and communicates his disappointment to a radio reporter conducting a live interview. Christine is listening from her Paris apartment that she shares with her husband, Robert, the the Marquis de la... I don't know what the difference is. Marquis de la Chesnay. She converses with her loyal maid, Lisette, what it means to be in love. Lisette is married to Robert's gamekeeper at the La Colonnaire estate, Schumacher but she is having an affair with Octave. Lisette is more dedicated to Christine than to her own husband. Lisette is aware of Christine's relationship with Andre, as is Robert. Christine and Robert discuss Andre's emotional outburst and pledge their devotion to one another. Feeling guilty, Robert excuses himself to make a telephone call to his mistress, Genevieve, and arranges a meeting for the next day so that he can end their affair. The next day, Robert tells Genevieve that he must end their relationship because he is in love with his wife. However, Robert invites his mistress to join him and Christine for a weekend retreat at Les Colonnaires. Genevieve secretly plans to win back Robert, even if she has to destroy his relationship with Christine to do so. Christine invites her niece, Jackie, who's attracted to Andre. Octave induces Robert to invite the now suicidal Andre to the estate as well, with the hope that they could possibly make a love connection between the dashing pilot and Genevieve, which would solve both Christine and Robert's problems. At Le Colonnaire, Schumacher is trying to eliminate the estate grounds of rabbits. He discovers several snares on the grounds that have been placed there by poacher Marceau. Schumacher catches Marceau, but Robert decides to hire him as a domestic employee so that he can use Marceau's ability to catch rabbits. Once Marceau actually enters the estate, he begins to flirt with Lisette, who returns his affections much to the chagrin of Schumacher. Robert's guests begin to arrive at the estate. Andre's arrival draws the attention of all the women who wish to meet him, including Jackie. The next day, the invited guests engage in a hunt on the estate grounds, which is led by Schumacher. 
During the hunt, Robert tells Genevieve that he no longer loves her, and she threatens to tell Christine about their affair. Robert placates her by giving her one last kiss, which is witnessed by Christine using some binoculars. Back in her room, Genevieve prepares to leave, defeated. However, Christine convinces Genevieve to stay while informing her that she is aware of the affair with Robert. Christine is hopeful that Genevieve will keep Robert occupied so that she can pursue other interests. That night, Robert and Christine host a masked ball and enlist the assistance of several guests to perform some musical numbers. During the night, various romantic liaisons are made. Andre and Christine declare their love for each other after Christine flirts with another man at the party. The couple plans to run away together. Marceau continues to pursue Lisette, which drives Schumacher into a jealous rage. Schumacher tries to shoot Marceau during the party, causing Robert to dismiss both men from his employment. Robert and Andre get into an argument over Christine and begin a fistfight before settling their differences. Octave declares his love for Christine as well, which causes Christine to doubt her feelings for Andre. Octave and Christine make plans to run away together. The terminated Schumacher and Marceau see the couple together and mistake Christine for Lisette, as she is wearing Lisette's cape and hood. Octave returns to the castle to grab his things and encounters Lisette and Andre. Lisette begs Octave not to leave with Christine. Octave sends Andre out to the greenhouse instead to meet Christine in his place. At the same time, Schumacher ret- retrieves his rifle and returns to the greenhouse. He shoots Andre dead, believing he is Octave, who he thinks is trying to run off with Lisette. Robert covers up the homicide and tells the other guests that there has been a horrible accident. He rehires both Schumacher and Marceau, who both know what really happened. Marceau and Christine appear to be haunted by the loss of their dear friend and lover. Nevertheless, they remain silent as to what really happened as the remaining crowd makes their own interpretations as to what really happened to Andre. And that is the rules of the game. Well done, because I know that my half-assed summaries are normally pretty ordinary, but you, how you got that out of the movie, well done, uh, the, considering all the French names as well. Yeah, well, yeah, the French names are the most difficult part. And and to be quite honestly, this film is so complicated to break it down into to like a one-page summary is really, really difficult. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot happening. Yeah. All right. So Rules of the Game was released on July 7th, 1939 in Paris. It was made on a budget of 5.5 million francs. I have no idea how that translates to American dollars at the time. I could <laughs> no. Not find no international gross, although it did gross 273, about almost $274,000 in the United States when it was released here. When it was orig- originally shown at a preview screening, the film ran 130... <laughs> 139? No, 113 minutes. I, I'm going to stumble all this all day. 113 minutes long. The preview audience did not go well. Um, so a cut, initial cut was made and reduced the film to 100 minutes long, and it, where it was ultimately released in, uh, in France. Those showings did not go well. So uh, Renard, Renard made additional cuts, cutting the film ultimately down to 85 minutes long. Uh, and that was the version that existed for many, many years. In 1959, some uh, fans of the film began collecting cuts of the or, or prints of the film from around France, as well as uh, finding some of the un- unused footage from the uh, studio and we're able to basically cobble together a new cut of the film that is the cut that we have now, the 106-minute version of the film. In 1952, the 85-minute version of the film uh, was voted by Sight and Sound uh, to be one of the 10 best films ever made, and that was their inaugural first list. Uh, Then, every year since, uh, in 1962, it was still at number three. At 1972, it was at number two again. Uh, In 19... Sorry, uh, it was at number two again in 1972, 1982, and 1992. In 2002, it fell to number three behind Citizen Kane and Vertigo. In 2012, it fell to number four behind Vertigo, Citizen Kane, and Tokyo Story. It's the only film to have been included on every top ten list since 1952 on Sight and Sound's uh, list. Empire Magazine ranked it number 13 on its list of the 100 best films of world cinema. 
in Le Figaro's 2000 li- 2008 list of greatest films ever made. It tied for second with Night of the Hunter behind Citizen Kane. It was chosen by Premiere Magazine as one of the 100 movies that shook the world in October 19 in its October 1998 issue. This list ranked the most daring movies ever made. It's included in the Toronto International Film Festival's Essential 100 uh, Movies Every Cinephile Should See. It's ranked number five non-English speaking film in the critics poll conducted by the BBC in 2018. It's included in Roger Ebert's Greatest Movies list. Also included in the the novel, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. And Rotten Tomatoes has it at 96% critics and 90% audience. So... Rules of the game. All right. We got through that finally. Woo. Yeah, that's I, a lot of info. I already feel like I'm losing my voice. But well, Shane, starting with, have we seen this before? Uh, had you ever seen this before, before we reviewed this for Golden Age of the Silver Screen? I've heard of it, but I've never, ever seen it. I know it was an inspiration for Robert Altman's uh, Gosford Park, which is a, one of my favorites of his. So I'd say around that time when that got released – a good 20 years ago, I think now, I would have been aware of this movie, but I never saw it at the cinema, never saw it uh, on TV, other than when I finally, years later, got the Criterion version of it. So it was a first watch for me when I got the Criterion not that long ago. All right. Well, that's interesting because I, too, have heard of the film, never actually seen it <laughs> and no. a, a, until I watched it for this podcast and the Criterion par- podcast. And... You know, I'd I'd heard of it. I I remember, I I vaguely remember having it in the store when I worked at Blockbuster, never picked it up and watched it. I know Chris is uh, from the, uh, Chris H from the the Movie House Memories podcast has referenced it. And that actually, before he left that show, actually had it on his list of films he wanted to review. So I know it's in his top 100 films of all time, but I never actually had watched it myself. So this was kind of a little bit of a thrill because I got to say, I actually really enjoyed the film. I really enjoyed it a lot. And it's not what I expected this film to be at all. I mean, did it meet your expectations? I mean, had you heard about, I mean, it's got quite a legacy. I mean, one of the considered by many to be one of the greatest films of all time, you know, well, firstly, I didn't know about the legacy. And um, like I said, I really only knew about it through Gosford Park. Uh, had you have you seen Robert Altman's Gosford Park? I saw it years ago. Yeah, yeah and yeah, what I okay. do remember of it, I I, I get it. It's th- the similarities of kind of the differences in classes that that film addresses is very similar to a lot of the things in this film. No, I I also really came out of it just happy i thought it was such a good movie there was a lot happening 1939 was such a big year too <laughs> of movies I know. So for, for it to get sort of not, not get lost in the mix but i didn't know about it i mean i know about several of the big 1939 movies wizard of oz and mothering heights and gone with the wind etc stagecoach but yeah, I never really just just slipped through my fingers. I just I, and I like foreign movies, so it wasn't because of that. I really did enjoy it, and there was it's just some fam- familiar faces in here too, which I was surprised at. I just recognised a lot of the actors, so I enjoyed it a lot. And it's I'm just surprised I had never come across it in the past. All right. Well, the you know, and, and I know we'll probably touch about this in Criterion as well, but. Even the history of this film, going into what version of the film have you seen? You know, I I always thought of Blade Runner as very unique (laughs) in a film that has multiple different cuts, slightly different uh, running times, and the versions potentially having very, very different meanings. And this film, I mean, it, it, part of it is there's it, the sad state of there's a there was a 113 minute version that is lost to time, you know, over time, completely lost, never be restored again. The 100 minute version arguably is lost to time as well. The 85 minute version and the 106 minute version from 1959 that got cobbled together is about all we have for this particular film, which is really fascinating. But that the you know we both wa- watch the Criterion disc at least and I hope you have the same one and I that shows some of the stuff that they added into the 106 minute yes. version which dramatically changes the storyline I mean dramatic Octave is pretty much n- uh, not even a, a, a major character in the film from the description from the 85 minute version and he's a cent one of the central characters 
of the film in the 106 minute version. I, I think some people could have argued that he's one, possibly one of the three main characters in it based off where the film begins and where the film ends. Oh, for sure. And yeah, my version just for the record was 106 minutes. So I'm assuming that's the same as yours. Yes. The criterion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, interesting about um, Octave because that's Jean Renault. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, very funny how you can you can snip little bits and pieces out of films and it changes the whole storyline and perceptive completely. Yeah, and and, and the the I mean the, the the sadness of whatever those original 1939 cuts, the 113 and the 100 minute version are gone, just never to be seen again. And we we have a good version, and this is the version that most people consider the you know one of the best of all time. Even uh, the director himself, you know, he was not involved in the restoration. He was shown their cut after it was done, and teared up because of what they had done. And and he's commented and said that the hit. His memory is there was only one really kind of a, a, a major scene that was missing, but it was not essential to the plot. And I, I thought that was really kind of interesting. Granted, he was looking at it 20 years after the fact. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he was would have been a fair age at that point. Yeah, for sure. But it's great that the people took time to restore it and fragment it back together. I mean, you never know. Films get uh, found all the time in basements and buildings. So you never know a print might turn up someday. I mean, it could, I mean, you're talking about a celluloid film. That yeah. Kind of celluloid degrading. lost films. I mean, um, I think that speaking of citizen Kane, um, there was an Orson Welles movie not that long ago that got rediscovered that was never released. So things can happen. Different versions of movies can pop up. Well, what did you think of, I mean, kind of, the history of this film that when it came out, it was widely found unacceptable, uh, panned and ultimately banned in France for a period of time. And then obviously when uh, the Nazis took over France, if, you know, shortly thereafter, obviously they were not including it. Uh, they were not showing it as well. Uh, you know, the, the idea that just the audiences did not like this social criticism of the, the class structure in France at the time. Well, it's funny back then then the audiences kind of like they do now at times have the, have a say in what gets released because yeah majority rules when things people enough people are upset about a film that can cause shockwaves and it means sometimes more box office dollars but it all, also can mean banning or taking away films which isn't good because that's it should be freedom of speech and um, the arts in particular as passionate as I am about arts and films uh, I don't think you should have to censor some things. No, no, I agree with you on that. But the, the, the just the kind of, I, you know, lack for lack of a better term, the uh, the audience revulsion of this kind of social yeah. commentary. And it was that time of era of the war, so a lot of fragile things happening as well. Tr tremendous amount of fragile. I mean, because the, the the descriptions in a lot of the Criterion stuff is that they're rushing to finish editing it and getting this out. And for a lot of the filmmakers to get out of France because they're afraid yes. of the Germans. <laughs> yeah, they were in exile, basically, where they were about to be. Yeah. Although yeah. Uh, the director ran off to Italy, which seems to be an odd place to run to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the, the history that has popped up on the, on the criteria that we learn about the film, considering I hadn't really known much about it beforehand. You know, one of the interesting things is that, and and not trying to bleed our two shows together with the Criterion, but the the question comes out of the some of the commentary by the director of Renoir, uh, stating that there is no main character in this, that you know no. that they are all equal, uh, you know. And I, at, when I watched him say that, it really, really gave me pause because, you know, to that moment when he said that, I was thinking of Octave as the prime, is the kind of the lead character because he's kind of the glue that holds most of those people together, that he's the connective tissue to all that, which is interesting since the the shorter version rid, pretty much was all his scenes. <laughs> they were cutting out his scenes uh, and and you know they were really reducing his impact in the film. Um, do you agree with that? That there's no, I mean, it's the director's interpretation. So, that, I mean, that's obviously what he intended with this. But do you see that, that, that same way? 
Yeah, yeah, no, I exactly do because there's a there's establishing establishing scenes at the start, you know, around Paris and the airport, and but then the movie just takes place out at the estate, and it's a bunch of characters crisscrossing each other, basically. Uh, yeah, so I would say that's a very accurate description. That there's a few main characters, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's not the plot line is not something that you would say is definitely the aim here it's more about the actions of the multiple character storylines and and another thing and once again coming from what Renoir said about the film as far there's there's, none of the characters are a villain in this I mean that he he said the villain are the rules of the game uh, themselves is how uh, the basically the class structures the society at that time defined how people would perceive things Uh, and ultimately that Andre uh, the obviously the pilot who ends up getting killed uh, was killed by the rules of the game itself that, you know, somewhat he didn't know how to follow the rules. He didn't, he didn't belong in that world. And because of his lack of understanding is what ultimately got him killed. What do you think of that? The fact, I mean, cause I don't see Robert as a really sympathetic character at the end of the film when he's basically writing off the murder of Andre, um, his wife's, you know, lover, yeah. Uh, to the other to the other members and basically uh, rehiring the guy who killed uh, the pilot, you know, in cold blood. No, you're right. I mean, if I, I would I would go as far as saying this, though, if you if there's someone being adulterous in a relationship, well, or, in a, you know, it's definitely a, a villain twi- twist there. So, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Like, there's people getting killed in this, and and they're just all over the place. It's a little bit – it's just the working classes emulating the social classes of the era, and which really isn't much different to what it's like now. What class do you think Octave puts himself in? I mean, well, maybe not puts himself, but where do you place him? Uh, He seems to put himself as kind of this floating – person almost leeching off his friends you know on the fence yeah the, yeah the, but he obviously especially with marceau at the end of the film he and marceau walk away together you know and he leaves the estate after that after his friend has been killed and uh, you know i i kind of wonder is where is he going what 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 is he going to do tomorrow and the next day after <laughs> that's got you wondering <laughs> um yeah yeah i guess um he, he sits on the fence you like it yeah he's just adapting to the situations and ends up as a major person in the mix yeah but does he truly understand the rules of the game because he seems at the end to be the only person suffering due to andre's death i don't think he understands fully but yes it's there and he could be acting a little bit as well to come across for sympathy. Yeah, I see. I, I thought that was one of the most interesting things because Christine, although I didn't think she really loved Andre, shows no emotion towards it at all. And her actually telling Jackie, who sh- is distraught over Andre being killed because she had affections towards him, I mean, she's telling Jackie basically to hold it together as they're walking back into the house in front of all the guests who are out there in their bathrobes. And then, yeah, yeah well, Christine's cold as ice anyway. Who it, who do you think she really loves? I mean, uh, that was something I was asking myself in the film. Was like, <laughs> does she? Really- I didn't ask myself that. I don't know. Um, she's just all for herself. Well, see, I, I see. I didn't see it as all for myself. I just saw that this, this woman is an aspect of wants the attention. I guess, yeah, if you will, that's true. The that's true. the affection. Um, but becomes bored by that very, very quickly. And I, I don't know if it's the excitement of a new relationship, but in the course of this film, you know, she doesn't show up Andre upsets Andre, but she was obviously having an affair with him before she rekindles her relationship with Robert after Andre has his out, outburst on the radio and basically that they promise to truly be love and be honest with each other, even though she knows about uh, uh, Genevieve, <laughs> You know, and then uh, Octave proposes bringing Andre to the party and getting convincing Robert to bring him to the party. And Octave has his own reasons to try to make that love connection. But she kind of wants him there. 
she addresses the rumor in the room with every, I mean, it was, it, there was so much about, there was so much complexity to that character that these constant contradictions, I was trying to figure out who is she really loving? Because in the course of the film, you've got Andre Robert, her husband, you got, and I forgot which character it was that during the uh, play, the kind of uh, performance portion of it, she's kind of messing around with another guy <laughs> Then, yeah, and then yeah, she I've forgotten got, who that character was. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't really that much of a consequence, and then professes her love for Octave, a person, you know, a, a man she's known most of her life, uh, previously from her her father and her uh, from her younger age, and then you know he she doesn't go off with him. She returns to Robert at the very end of the film after Andre is killed. I mean, what did you think of that? I thought she was the most complex and hard to understand characters and I don't want to say hard to understand that I was frustrated with it it was hard it's like this is obviously intentional but I'm trying to re get a read on who this character is well you've definitely put more thought into it than I did however I would say that she feeds off she doesn't like routine and um, gets bored easily and just feeds off people uh, making a fuss over and being a center of attention no matter what the consequences are well, and let me ask you this about her as well. We'll move on past Christine. But That's all right. No, she's good. And the actress who plays her, Nora Gregor, is great. No, she like, was really she was good. phenomenal. Everybody in the cast, pretty much everybody in the cast, I thought was great. I had no uh, complaints about anyone, even the director. You, you know, he's not, I know he's acted before this film, but he's not, that's not his primary uh, no. responsibility, primary skill set. I thought he was really good as Octave, but earlier in the film, there are people talking about Christine and basically kind of that because that she's not French, I believe she was Austrian. Her character was Austrian and that, you know, that she kind of doesn't almost doesn't f f know how to fit in with, uh, the f French, uh, upper class, if you will. Uh, and, but by the end of the film, do you think that she has a complete and uh, uh, working knowledge of the rules of the game and actually not because she's telling Jackie what she needs to do, even though one of her lovers has just been killed in front of her? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. The class distinctions have limitations, but I don't think she sees that. So I like what you just said then. She's telling people what to do because she wants it done. Very, very powerful mind going ticking along in that head of hers. All right. Well, this, as we said, there's a lot of different characters. There's some, obviously some more lead characters. There's no one central character. At the end of the day, who did you really? What performance stood out to you? You know, which which one? You know, I just said they're all good, but I know which one stands out to me that I really like. But which one did you like the best? Uh, well, Nora Gregor actually probably stood out the most is Christine for obvious reasons. Um, and another one of the female actresses, I think her name was Odette Talisac, Madame Charlotte mm -hmm. de la Plante. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So Charlotte was pretty good. And the, the guy that was the croupier in Casablanca, he oh. was in it. Oh, and I I'm didn't like, catch that. That was pretty good. Remember? Yeah. Uh, I forgot his name, but like, I think, I think, as I said at the top of this podcast recording, I remember a lot of these faces from various French movies that I've seen in the past, but just couldn't pick their names. So, yeah, I would say Christine, but then Charlotte as well. The guys were not quite as memorable to me. I know you were saying about Octave. He, I think he just maybe couldn't have uh, put any other actor in that <laughs> role. And he's gone, oh, I'll just play it myself. That might have been the way from that director just saying, yeah, I'll take this role. Maybe not. Maybe it was something he wanted to do or was cast at. But I don't know. It's such an ensemble. I did only had really those two standouts. Oh, I'll, I'll agree with you on Nora Gregor. I thought she was outstanding. And, and my my questions about that character was created by her performance and her nuance to it. And that's, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, and that's why I really kind of enjoyed what, I mean, I thought that was a fascinating, fascinating character. The actor who plays, um, I oh got I'm blocking uh, Robert. Uh, her husband is he, he was, uh, he was, he was good, but he was very, very flat. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I thought that that was basically that, 
he didn't get excited or upset about anything. Even when he's getting into a fight, even when he's having arguments, he still sit, re, remains pretty even keel. After Andre is ki- killed, he's this calming influence trying to calm everybody r- down and explain the horrible, horrible accident that just occurred. Yeah, yeah. Did you so you thought he stood out, Robert? No, well, no, no. But it was it was a different performance. As, if you want to talk about the male standout, I like Jean Renard, Renard playing Octave. I thought yeah. he, he was yeah. the access point for to me. For the audience is that, as you said, that he's kind of on this fence. He's, you know, he he's seeing the 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 playing field, if you will, and he's bouncing around between all the characters. And he very much is the connective tissue. It is hard for me to imagine, and I have not seen the eighty-five minute version. That if you cut him out of this film, that this film is nearly as effective. I, I really would have a hard time. I don't think I would enjoy it nearly as much with less of him in it because I think he really ties together a lot of the themes and really creates, as I said, the access point for the audience. I mean, he, if I have to have sympathy for a character, and granted, I have sympathy for Andre being shot, but. I, I I saw I, there's an aspect of to that character that character at the beginning of the film wanted to die, and yes. literally got his wish because I don't believe he was ever going to end up with uh you know with Christine at any point in time in the future that he, he had a death wish and if he wasn't with Christine he wanted to die so he got his wish not the way he wanted to but he got his no. wish ultimately. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think Christine really did shake up and shake up the whole storyline of of certain characters but you're right if um octave was cut out in that shorter version that you were saying it existed at some point um totally different and i don't know if i'd enjoy it as much no i i i can't believe that even though sight and sound made ranked it in 1952 as one of the top 10 greatest films of all time and that was the 85 minute version I don't think this film is nearly as powerful. It really, really is not. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised at that. And, and, and I'm not surprised at, that it didn't play well with audiences, although I think the war really kind of had, an, or the impending war, the, and the fear of the war probably had a, 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 a dampening impact on what this film was going to do. Oh, yeah. Well, Europe was about to go up in flames. So, yeah, the impact of what was happening <laughs> is definitely... Uh, yeah, it made sense about certain things in the movie and then obviously the history of the movie as well. Shane, you got anything else you want to talk about? I'll bring up the music mm-hmm. uh, only because I like to. Mm-hmm. However, there's nothing really remarkable remarkable about the music in this film. Um, the composer was someone I hadn't heard of before, Joseph Cosma. Uh, done a lot of movies, even right up into the 2000s. Um, or, or his music has appeared in films up into the early 2000s. But, um, yeah, no, no, just thought I'd mention it because it, it didn't have major impact in me, but it, it was suitable to the film itself. Uh, and I wanted to mention The Masked Ball. That scene is terrific, really, really good and inspirational, and some of the costumes and the, the gowns were amazing. No, I I, th- I mean the the sets were amazing in this film. Considering the, yeah, especially- set decoration and production uh, uh, production design was yeah second to none. Well, I don't know the budget in francs. I couldn't tell you what that is either in Australian dollars, but yeah, it looked good. That as well as the complexity of this set. I mean, this, this was all my understanding was a soundstage when they were doing interiors. And, oh, you could tell. Yeah, I knew it was. You could tell it was a soundstage. Yeah, but the depth of field to it. There, there's one particular shot where Andre and Robert are walking towards camera down a long hallway shortly before Octave comes in to grab his coat to run off with, um, with uh, Christine. I keep wanting to say Claudette, but it's Christine. Christine. And, yeah. yeah, and they're having a conversation about Christine. In the background, you see Lisette. And you see Octave it, far in the background. This depth of field. I mean, I thought it was just ama- the amazing coordination and that you're, there's so much going on on the screen pretty much at all times that, uh, you know, even though they're not the focus, if you, you, the, you know, and I caught this uh, the second time I watched this when I was watching it, the uh, commentary. Uh, from for the rules of the game on the criterion i didn't catch it the first time because i was focused on robert and uh andre and the subtitles on the bottom of the screen trying to read that that i wasn't paying it the second time i was actually watching everything that was going on the outside and i thought they they did that a lot where they're 
even though there's a main focus of the camera, everything is still moving along the background and there's stuff going on that you miss if you're not paying attention to it. And it, it's not necessarily that it's gra you know, grand things, but it's still furthering the plot and putting you in a time place that, you know, you're gives you an idea of what's going on. And I thought the, the complexity of that, instead of just having a two shot of two guys talking, you know, walking down the hallway or standing still, you have all these actors continuing to move the plot in the background. Amazing. Yeah. Again, uh, reference to Gosford Park and, and some and other Robert Altman films, as you know, he'd have a whole lot of things going in the foreground as well as the background. Right. And I did notice, I can't even read my own writing, but I wrote notes and I've got four names down here for um, cinematography. So maybe there was maybe a main cinematographer and the rest were assistants, but they might have had multiple cinematographers too working on this, uh, which would explain how great it actually pans out and looked. And also in my notes here, it says Coco Chanel <laughs> did, the cost, did the costumes. So there you go. That was why those gowns look so amazing. All right. Well, you've referenced Altman a couple of times, and obviously, I just just reminds me, and I, I only sorry to cut you off, but I just before knowing anything about this movie, and I put it on and press play and started to watch. I'm like, here we go, Gosford Park, and then go back and into the history of it and Altman himself has said this was an inspiration to that film yeah the, I think his exact quote is the rules of the game taught me the rules of the game uh, yeah. So. yeah yeah I couldn't believe it so my instincts were right no no I mean the the effect on uh Altman's approach to films, which gives me a better appreciation for Altman, which he is very hit and miss with me with films. But, you know, the, the, as you said, what's going on in the background is just as important. What's going on in the foreground, overlapping dialogue. You've got that in this film where characters are overlapping, yeah. which is hard with a subtitled film to make sure that I'm understanding what is what I'm supposed to pay attention to. And the fact that I th obviously I think with a subtitled film, they're giving me the dialogue for the, you know, to the main characters and they're not necessarily giving me the interpretation of the dialogues going behind there. So I do think something is lost in the uh, translation uh, for this film that we don't get, that we probably would get from a Robert Altman film because we can understand both conversations at the same time. Uh, oh yeah. It helps if you understood, spoke and understood French, you would pick up a lot more because not every foreign film, has dialogue lost in translation yeah. sadly shane so well let's go ahead and wrap this up what would you ultimately give a ranking for this film on a one to five stars five stars being the best uh what what, what would you give the rules of the game i'd give it a four because you can tell the inspiration it has on other films and just the craft of it all and considering the time and the era this was filmed and knowing thankfully through the criterion about what the filmmakers were going through and where they were going next. Uh, I, can, I, I wouldn't say it's one of the best films ever made. Like I know it's on all these lists, um, but it's definitely an inspiration and worth watching, not just for film buffs, but for people who like good acting, um, interesting dialogue and some beautiful um, photography and costumes. All right. Well, uh, and here's a question I forgot to ask you earlier, but I'm going to ask you now, what genre would you put it in? Oh, <laughs> I can't. The drama, obviously, but it's not that romantic. I'd say I'd have to say drama, but that's that's with a question mark. My, my the first I don't know half of the film I would say comedy. I mean, yeah, the, there's slapstick elements in a way. Yeah, yeah. It was. A, it, it is a tough one to pigeonhole into one category. There's some comedic elements. There's obviously some kind of like romantic tryst farce going on here. And obviously there is some heavy drama ends in tragedy. Uh, so, you know, to say, I, I guess the best would be to say dramedy, but I don't even think that's a fairly accurate description of it. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't go putting it in dramedy entirely, but you're right. I, I kind of, that, I overlooked that. There was some follies and some comedic elements at the start, which kind of filtered through the whole movie, but it does change a little bit of direction about the halfway mark. Well, this is this is a tough one for me. Well, it wasn't really a tough one. This is my knee-jerk reaction to the ranking this film. I'd give it five stars. 
That wow, that is I, huge. I, I, I loved watching this film. And I loved watching stuff about the making of this film and the discussion of this film. I thought it was utterly fascinating to, to, and, and I was completely unaware other than, you know, I knew of its existence and I knew Crisp said it was in his top 100. Now, if you ask me right now, would I put it in my top 100? I can't tell you that yet. Um, right now, having watched it once for the film, once for the commentary and was paying more attention to the visuals, I'd like to watch it again uh, and to really, really kind of, uh, to explore it to see if I would put it in my top 100. Cause I think we might be reviewing this again on another show, which damn it, I uh, would, <laughs> wouldn't have reviewed it on this show if I'd known I was going to do that. But it, you know, it was an unknown quantity to me and I really, really enjoyed it. But have, having only watched it the two times and literally back to back, I don't know if, it, you know, I want to make sure that it's one of those films I think is going to stay up there. But I, I, without a doubt, I still think it's a five star film. There are five star film that's are, are not in my top 100, but uh, I, I I think this is a, a, a amazing film. I'm surprised I got this late in life and had not watched it myself prior to this, and and that's my fault. Yeah, oh, I'm the same. I can't believe it's just the first well two watches like you because I did the commentary. But uh, I am shocked, Patrick. Um, in a way, because it usually takes a little bit longer for you to give something full stars. But uh, it obviously made an impact on you straight away. And I mean, I love discovering it, but I wouldn't give it a five oh, out I, of five. Not you, yet. You know, the, for the and, and a lot of it is it, it is a challenging film. I mean, just as we sit here and say what genre is in it is that I was, you know, I had no idea where this plot was going. I had, you know, no. to, to go in. It, it, I went into it literally cold. I didn't know anything about this film other than Jean Renard, Renard directed it. And that it was on Criterion. It had, and my Criterion box has a little cartoon cover, so I thought it was a straight comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, mine's completely different. Yeah. Mine's all little squares with scenes from the film and actors. Yeah, I didn't know anything about like kind of the commentary on class or French society. Um, I, I didn't know anything about it, and I just just went along for the journey and I really, I, I just, I was enthralled with it and had a really, really good time watching it. And then when I was done, I'm going, how did I not, how, how's no one ever brought this to my attention before? How has no one ever talked about this to me, this film again? Cause I, obviously I talked to a lot of people who know a lot about movies and other than Chris saying it was in his top 100, that's all I knew about it. You know, that was so it was it was an amazing journey to go on. And I really, in, really, really enjoyed the film. I, I will, as I said, I hesitate to say it's in my top 100 because I just recently saw it. I kind of want to have it percolate and just process it. And maybe in a couple of months, revisit that and watch it again and see, you know, if it still has that same impact and um, and to, to watch it for the story again and not so much for the, the visual details as I was during during the commentary. But uh, uh, I yeah, I would I, I really I, I I cannot recommend the film enough. I thought it was a great film. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you're selling me on it even more. But <laughs> it's not it's not a movie that in discussion when you bring up 1939. No, it's not a movie that comes up. No, it never has for me. Yeah, I, you know, and I agree with you that you know this just makes 1939 even a more seminal year for even for, better. Yeah, for cinema and and uh, you know with Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach, uh, would you say Wuthering Heights? Yeah, you know, Wuthering Heights, the Laurence Olivier version, which is probably my favorite. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, you, those are stellar films. At least I want to say at this point, two of those films have already been nominated for top 100 on Movie House Memories. I know s someone is picking Stagecoach to go in there as well, so uh, we'll be reviewing Stagecoach on that show at some point in time down the road, and possibly this. I mean, you're talking about some great films all coming out within a few months of each other. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. that I'm glad that we watched it. No, I'm, I'm very glad we watched it. I've been actually looking forward to doing this podcast because, unfortunately, uh, I do podcasts for Lunchtime Movie Review, and I've seen a lot of crap on there lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've probably picked a few of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't all be rules of the game. Some of them have to be Cherry 2000. So <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, that does it for this month's review of the rules of the gang. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our monthly podcast. 
If you've had a good, good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. Uh, you can follow us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network community. Additionally, uh, we do have some news. Uh, we are going to be going to a YouTube-only format here starting on February 1st of 2021, a couple of months from now. Uh, we won't be, uh, unfortunately, uh, uploading our podcast onto uh, podcast streaming platforms due to the fact that it's getting too damn expensive for us to pay for it and do it. So we're going to be exclusively on YouTube. So if you want to keep following us, subscribe to our YouTube account and you'll get updates as to when we post a new podcast. We're going to follow the same regular schedule, the same regular uh, shows. They're just all going to be on YouTube starting on February 1st. And if you've had a good time and you've enjoyed the podcast, uh, feel free to leave a comment for us on our website at www.moviehousememories.com where you can tell us if you've done a good job, a bad job, whether you like this film, whether you disagree with our opinions, and if there's any films you'd like for us to review on Golden Age of the Silver Screen. Uh, we appreciate any feedback we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Golden Age of the Silver Screen. Until next time, I'm Patrick. And I'm Shane. And we'll see you all next time at our house. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The song Hyperfun is brought to you by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the golden age of the silver screen, the MHN Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC unless otherwise noted.